Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming this morning. Uh, my, my name is Hal Finkel, and uh, I lead the Compiler Technology and Programming Languages group at the Leadership Computing Facility at Argonne National Laboratory. The Na Argonne National Laboratory is an open science lab that's funded by the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Science. And I'm here to talk to you about bringing just-in-time compilation to C++. I'm going to take just a minute and give you a kind of backstory while we're here looking at this fast car uh, to tell you how I ended up working on this. Uh, Argonne National Laboratory's computing facility has some of the largest supercomputers in the world, and in a couple of years, we'll have the nation's first exascale supercomputer. We've been focused uh, under the auspices of the Exascale Computing Project in preparing our applications and our software technology for the future of HPC. And as part of that, we were working on, are working on auto-tuning technology. And I've come to believe that the way that we can actually deploy auto-tuning technology at scale in production is to use just-in-time compilation. And we've been working on this for several years, and we designed a system that would, we had a design for a system that would enable us to integrate auto-tuning technology using just-in-time compilation into our applications. And after we designed this system, I went and started to, had the design for the system, I should say, we went and started to talk to various potential internal customers. And I received a response from many of them. And you may be familiar with this kind of response in kind. They said to me, well, that's nice, Hal, but it doesn't solve the problem we actually have. You see, the way that many of our electrical applications adapt to different kinds of systems, to different hardware, to different kinds of problem configurations, is that they use C++ templates. Their code is templated. These templates take various kinds of policy types to adjust for different hardware and memory layouts. They have non-type template parameters to adjust for different aspects of the configurations that they need to deal with. Uh, Sometimes they deal with these things and switch out the templates dynamically. Sometimes they know ahead of time. But uh, regardless, many of them are quite burdened by long compilation times. They have to instantiate a whole lot of these templates when they build. And they don't necessarily have a great system for dynamically choosing between them at runtime either. So I thought, ah, so in order to do this, we need to be able to dynamically adjust what templates are being used at one time. I can fix that. And so now, skip forward a year or so, and here I am. Before I go on, I want to tell you what the purpose of this talk is, what kind of talk this is supposed to be. I'm going to talk to you about a tool. I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm going to, to talk to you about the tool. I'm going to show you some uh, performance results that we've received, that we've uh, generated with this tool. I'm going to talk to you about various kinds of design considerations. Uh, but that's not really the purpose of the talk. The purpose of the talk is to encourage everyone to think about the future of C++ and to think about just-in-time compilation technology and to think about how just-in-time compilation technology might impact the future of C++. That's the point of the talk. So let me start by saying, why do people use just-in-time compilation technology? Obviously, there's not one answer to that question. The use case that many people are probably most familiar with uh, is use just-in-time just -time compilation technology because you can't do anything else. Say you're a web browser, and you receive textual source code from the internet, and you have to run it quickly. Well, then you just in time compile. Some people use just in time compilation technology because it's not feasible to compile everything ahead of time. There's a program productivity argument to it. You shorten your compile times if you compile only what you need at runtime. And you might use just in time compilation technology because you need to adapt or specialize at runtime. You do this for performance in many cases, and that's what we're going to focus on. But there are also non-performance reasons that you might do this as well, like for adaptive sandboxing. 
Let me come back to this performance case for a moment, though. If we think about the kinds of advantages that we can get from specializing code at runtime, and we'll show this in more detail later, and we think about the trends in hardware technology, we're kind of driven to the following conclusion. As you know, serial CPU speeds have really stopped increasing. Everyone here is likely familiar with the aspect of this trend. But there's another trend which is equally important, which is that heterogeneous computing is becoming increasingly prevalent. Modern computers are not just a CPU. They're not even just a CPU and a GPU. They have lots of different kinds of computational hardware on them. And you often don't quite know exactly what you're going to run on until you're running there. There are all sorts of different trade-offs between what hardware you use for what purpose and when. And this kind of hardware really screams for dynamic adaptation. But moreover, even if you don't care about any of that, the fact that CPU speeds have stopped increasing, their serial clock rates are not going up means that if you want to make your application faster, you can parallelize, and you should. But you may also use the transistors that are there more efficiently. And one way of doing that is to generate specialized code. In C++, just-in-time compilation is already all around us. There are any number of frameworks, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you haven't. There are libraries. Here I've highlighted a few. Maybe you've probably heard of TensorFlow, for example. Here I have Halide, OpenCL, et cetera. All of these use just-in-time compilation. These are all libraries that you use from C++. So just-in-time compilation in C++ uh, are not strangers. But and I should say, you know, we're seeing an increasing number of these things over time because specialization for performance is important. But there is a problem. And the problem is that the process by which you can create a just-in-time compilation engine is complicated. You, you need a spe specialized set of skills. It's not true that just because you're a good C++ programmer, for example, you know how to create a high-performance JIT. And so the availability of the technology in practice is, is limited. Now, I should try and clarify, for those of you who aren't familiar, what does it really mean to create a just-in-time comp compilation engine for your application? It doesn't mean that you write code that prints assembly instructions, hopefully. That's uh, we've, we've worked quite hard uh, as a community to produce frameworks that abstract from that. Uh, and here I've highlighted a, a couple of uh, different C++ libraries that are available. Uh, and you can see here more or less how you might use them. Here's LVM, here's native JIT, here's a wrapper for LVM. And uh, I'm not going to explain the details, but you can see here that, I mean, you're writing C++ code. You're not printing assembly instructions. Uh, but, but you are writing the code that writes the code one operation at a time, one control structure at a time. This is more productive than writing assembly, but it's not anywhere near as productive as writing C++ code. And if you already have C++ code, that implements the thing that you would like to specialize. You can't use it directly with any of these kinds of technologies. So one question that I've been asked when I've started talking about using just-in-time compilation technology in C++ is, can you construct a JIT for C++? just the same way that we have JITs for JavaScript or Java or other languages like that. Can't you just directly reuse that kind of technology? And 
one thing to realize is the answer is essentially no. That doesn't work. It's not that you can't have runtime adaptation in running C++ programs. We had an interesting talk earlier this week on, uh, on WebAssembly that demonstrated applications written in C++ that were essentially running in a just-in-time compilation engine. That, if that's what you're trying to do, that's a solved problem in that sense. Uh, but the C++ compilation part was all done ahead of time. That's a single step. And one thing to realize is that Modern JITs for languages like JavaScript or Java or what have you, you know, they rely on this multi-tiering system. And one of the core principles of that multi-tiering system is that you can do a fast initial compilation pass and then go back and optimize the stuff you need later. Well, C++, the language itself, just isn't amenable to that. You, uh, we have templates. That's our mechanism for specialization. But evaluating templates forces a lot of work to happen right at the very beginning. In fact, you have to process the templates even to parse the code correctly. So there's, there's no way that you can have a kind of fast first tier. And this is, this is really important to, to realize. It's a blessing and a curse. You have control over what gets specialized. You can force the compiler to generate specializations when you want. Uh, but that means it can't avoid doing that without programmer direction. And what I'm going to show you is programmer direction. Uh, but the other thing I, I want to talk about is quickly is the relationship between specialization and generic programming. Uh, when we think about generic programming, when we think about uh, writing code that can abstract over abstract types, uh, there are essentially two different ways we think about doing that. Uh, one way is to use generics. Many programming languages have generics. And in this context, C++ could support the style of programming as well. Of course, we have virtual functions and all of that related technology. Uh, the other way of programming over abstract types is to use specialization. And C++ supports that paradigm as well. That's what we have C++ templates for. And if you think about the relationship between just-in-time compilation and generic programming, you realize that in languages that use generics exclusively, that don't have templates, I'm thinking things like you know, languages like Java or JavaScript, the way that they support specialization is that the programmer writes code that semantically uses generics, semantically uses runtime dispatch, and then the system adaptively behind the scenes hopefully turns the relevant code that you need into a high-performance special, specialized implementation. Whereas with C++, there is none of that runtime adaptivity. So if you choose runtime dispatch, for the most part, and compilers try really hard to devirtualize and all of that, but for the most part, that's what you get. On the other hand, with C++, if you want specialization, you use templates. The you pay all the cost for doing the specialization, but you've directed that to happen. So what are the costs for specialization? Well, generally we think about costs in, in a couple of different categories. There are, there's the cost of compiling the specialization. This is a sort of program productivity cost in most senses, but also C++ compilers tend to take a lot of memory, as you may have noticed at times. Uh, the more templates you instantiate, the more memory your compiler uses. And sometimes that can be an important factor. Also takes a long time to compile a whole lot of templates. Um, also, if you compile templates and then you only use some of them at runtime, you may have a kind of runtime dispatch cost. This is a system that you, as the programmer, have to design, but nevertheless, it's not free. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are performance advantages to the specialized templates, hopefully. Otherwise, you shouldn't do that. Uh, and so if we think about using just-in-time compilation in C++, when we think about this cost-benefit trade-off, we have to think about kind of transferring the cost of compiling the specializations, that compile time cost. We're going to transfer it between categories. We're going to take it out of the programmer productivity category, the memory overhead category, what have you, and put that on the runtime side as, a, as another trade-off we have to consider. 
on that side of the equation. So when we started thinking about how we would design a just-in-time compilation system for C++ in order to address these use cases, we highlighted three core requirements. The first requirement was it had to naturally integrate into the language. It had to be easy to use. It had to be able to allow us to reuse the existing code that we had uh, and specialize it at runtime. Uh, the second requirement uh, was that it should not access the file system at runtime. So uh, we have many applications that run in many different environments, from embedded environments where file system access is difficult for various reasons, to high-performance computing environments with large-scale distributed file systems where file system access is difficult. Uh, and so the requirement was that all of the metadata that was necessary for this process to work had to be inside the binary. Everything had to be included. Uh, and the third requirement was that it had to be as incremental as possible. So C++ compilation is expensive. Uh, it would not be acceptable if every time you had to instantiate a new template at runtime, uh, you had to essentially recompile the whole translation unit. That, that would have been a non-starter. Okay, so those are our requirements. Um, and so now I'm going to talk to you about the initial implementation that we have of this. Uh, it's available on my GitHub page. And you're free to try it out yourself. Let me first show you the hello world. So here's hello world. The, uh, I'm going to talk to you a, little, in a couple of slides about what the actual semantics of the special attribute here are. But let me just quickly give you an overview, which is that here we have one function template, and it has a special attribute on it, as you might be able to see. It says clangjit on it. That's the attribute. And then there's a main function. The main function instantiates this function template and, and executes it. Uh, and it looks sort of normal. Let's build a pin in that. We'll get back to that. Uh, at the point of instantiation. Um, and here you can see we have this parameter, a, which is a runtime variable. It's not const, const expert, or anything else in that vein. Um, but yet, I'm putting it into the template argument list. It is a template parameter here. Uh, and this, in some sense, is the essence of the system. We have a template. I could not possibly be instantiating this template at compile time because the template, the non-type template argument here, this int x, uh, has to take a runtime value. And this is the interface that the user sees to this system. That's, that's all there is. Here's a slightly more complicated example. Uh, as I mentioned, not only do we dynamically choose non-type template parameters, but often we want to choose policy types and other things dynamically. And so here I have another system. Uh, you will note it deals with strings, and that's ugly. We can put a pin in that to get back to that as well. Uh, but here, again, we have a template. Um, it takes a type. It prints out its size. This is not particularly exciting. Uh, but here you can see the actual name of the type comes from a command line argument to this program. It instantiates a template and runs it. And if I instantiate this template and run the program, here's what I see, at least in whatever system I was testing on. It's probably a 64-bit x86 Linux system. And so you can see here, if you provide various names for these types, the Compiler at runtime will instantiate the relevant template, run it, and that causes output to be printed to the screen. All right. So, what are the semantics of this magic attribute, playing jet? Well, you put it on function templates. It tells you, tells the compiler not to instantiate the template at compile time. I will, by the way, use compile time to mean ahead of time compile time, because now there's kind of two compile times. But all right. uh, it will not instantiate it at, at compile time. That will be deferred until runtime. Uh, the second thing that uh, this, this attribute does is it makes it so that uh, non-constant expressions can be provided for the non-type template parameters of the template. Uh, and these will be used at runtime to instantiate the template. 
Uh, and, and also for constant ray references, uh, the data that's associated with that, since now we know the size, will turn into an uh, initializer for a context for a variable. This will be important when we talk about regular expressions. Here. And, and the third thing, as I demoed on the previous slide, uh, is that if you have a type argument, uh, you'll provide a type, you can provide a string or something that can be converted into a string, uh, then that string will be used to look up the relevant type and instantiate it. There are, as you might imagine, a couple of restrictions that come along with this. Uh, the, the template, the function template, the body of that function is not instantiated at compile time. Uh, that means that the C++ language features that depend on knowing the return type, the deducing it from something in the body, they can't work. Uh, so, the, you know, your, your decal type auto, any, anything that relies on type deduction, that relies on having the body of the template instantiated, that you can't do at compile time. That's a, that's a restriction. The other thing is, because the function isn't really instantiated at compile time, you can't use the function itself as a non-type template argument, as you would normally be able to do with functions with, with linking. All right, so what happens when you actually compile the, the program and you use this just-in-time compilation feature? Well, uh, you run Clang, you provide the magic command line argument, um, and most of the code is just compiled as usual. Uh, references to these just-in-time uh, compiled uh, function templates uh, get sort of transformed internally into calls to a runtime library. And also the, the AST, the abstract syntax tree, and a bunch of other metadata uh, are serialized into the object file. Uh, and when you link and you provide the dash f dit flag, uh, the, the relevant uh, Clang libraries are linked into your application. Now I said you serialize a bunch of metadata into the object file, let me quickly tell you a little bit more about what that is. Uh, first, as I said, there is the abstract, abstract syntax tree. Uh, in fact, in the implementation, I reuse the logic that Clang has for generating modules uh, in order to do this. So you can actually think about the compiler generating a module from your source code and embedding that into the object file. These tend to be large, by the way. You can put a pin in that. Uh, we save command line arguments and other things that are relevant for reconstructing the state of the compiler. We save the optimized IR for the portion of the object file that's compiled ahead of time. Uh, and we save a table that has the addresses of, uh, of local variables in the, in the translation <coughs> because you may need those later in case your function templates refer to them. Uh, the other thing I... I, I will note, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this in great amount of detail, but the implementation playing it also supports CUDA, and so uh, if you happen to be programming for NVIDIA GPUs, uh, you, you can also at runtime instantiate uh, GPU kernels, and if you do that, then a whole bunch of other, of other information also has to get saved in order to enable that to work. Now, at runtime, when you run the application, the application runs as it usually would. Uh, except for the fact that if you hit one of those runtime library calls that the compiler inserted for the runtime template instantiation, first thing that happens is it tries to look up the instantiation in a cache. This uses one of LVM's optimized dense map uh, hash tables and it is relatively fast. Now, if it's the first time that you're using the runtime library, uh, it essentially has to reconstitute the state of the compiler using the saved AST and all that other data. And it does so. Uh, then it <clears throat> will uh, instantiate the requested template. It does this incrementally because it's reconstituted its state of all the previous stuff it's compiled. So it only has to now generate code for stuff it hadn't generated code for before. Uh, that code is then handed off to LVM's optimization pipeline, and then from there, uh, it's handed off to LVM's just-in-time compilation infrastructure, which 
essentially speaking, generates an in-memory shared library, links it into your application, and lets us look up the relevant symbols that we need. Control flow returns to your application, and everyone is happy. That's how it works. Okay, so let me quickly talk about, uh, I'll show you some quick benchmarks so you can kind of think about how all this fits together. Uh, here's a quick benchmark. Uh, it uses the Eigen library. Eigen is a, a matrix mathematics library, and it's, it's convenient for this purpose uh, because it's a matrix library and it supports both dynamically sized and statically sized matrices just by changing some of the template parameters. Uh, and so it's convenient for this benchmark. The benchmark doesn't really do anything particularly interesting. It does this uh, iterative matrix calculation here, uh, which is here. And in this case, I'm showing you the version that uses traditional ahead of time compilation. Uh, it, it, uh, here is this, is templated on this type T and here we instantiate this for float and double and long double because we may need to choose between those at runtime. And, uh, and you can see here the sizes are just regular parameters. And here it says dynamic because those are dynamic sizes. All right, here's the JIT version. So uh, here I have the magic Clang JIT attribute. Uh, and when I instantiate this template down here, you can see I now pass these parameters as template arguments so that the matrices can be compiled, spe you know, specialized, compiled at runtime. So before I show you runtime performance, let me talk a little bit about compile time. This is compile time, meaning ahead of time compile time. And I have, so this time is in seconds, and I have subtracted from all of these times the baseline. The baseline, by that I mean, if you take an empty source file, include the eigen headers, and run that through Clang, however long that takes, I subtracted that from these times. All right. So when you compile the version with just a just in time compilation, uh, it takes about a second. If you compile the ahead of time, uh, the, the regular dynamically dynamic size version, the one with the dynamic tags on the matrix template, uh, if you do that just for one type, it takes two and three quarters seconds. If you decide, actually, I want all three of the types, float, double, and long double, as I had on the previous slide, uh, then it takes seven seconds to compile. Now, you might think, well, how long does it take to instantiate those specialized versions? Now, the time to do this at runtime is not any faster or slower, really, than the time to do it ahead of time. So here I have some time. If I want to take the specialized uh, matrix versions for a one by one matrix, the simplest possible case, uh, that takes a third of a second. For three by three, it takes two thirds of a second. For seven by seven, it takes three quarters of a second. 16 by 16, it takes two and a third seconds. Uh, and these roughly are linear. So if you compile both the, you know, the, the 16 by 16 case and the seven by seven case, then it takes 3.1 seconds, which is essentially this time plus that time. Okay, so there's not, there's no magic. All right, so what happens when you run these things? Now, uh, these times here uh, do not include the time spent compiling the just-in-time compiled version at runtime. This is just, so assume for a moment that you have amortized that cost. What do you get for runtime performance? So here's, here's what you get. This is time relative to the JIT. So the JIT, the just in time, uh, the time taken by the just in time compiled version is normalized to one. Uh, I have here in red the time for the ahead of time specialized version. If I knew what size it was and I compiled just that version and ran it, how long would that take? You can see it's essentially equivalent to the just in time compiled version. The, uh, um, and then here in, in beige, I have the time for the ahead of time version run with whatever relevant sizes these are. And you can see here that uh, when the matrix sizes are small, it makes a big difference. As the matrix sizes get larger, it makes a smaller and smaller difference. And this makes a lot of sense. When 
you know the trip counts of all of your relevant loops. And you know that they're small. Like if you know precise, I mean, they're not only small, but you know exactly what the trip count is and that number is small. There's a lot the compiler might do in order to unroll those loops and optimize that code. As the trip counts get larger, as the matrix sizes get larger, it doesn't really matter as much to the compiler exactly how big a big number is. And so the difference between that and what it does for the generic trip count is much smaller. And thus the performance difference is smaller. Uh, I said I'm not going to dwell on the CUDA support, but I, I do want to point out one thing. Uh, the difference between the specialized code and the generic code is much, much bigger on the GPUs uh, by an order of magnitude or more. So uh, here I have for various sizes. Uh, I've, I've done this two ways. I'm not going to talk about this in any great detail, but uh, the blue marks here are when you're running one thread per block, and the orange ones here are for running 512 threads per block. And uh, what you can see here is for the very small matrix sizes, uh, the just-in-time compiled version is you know, 100 and something times faster than the generic ahead of time version. That's, that's pretty significant. Uh, but the, the other interesting thing here is uh, as, uh, as you uh, increase, you know, so as, as, you, as you increase the matrix sizes here, um, you know, again, as, as I said, you, know, you, you expect the difference to shrink, and it does. But the other interesting effect here is that um, you get more of an effect up here uh, when you're running more threads per block. And that's because when you look at performance on a GPU, you know, you're worried about serial performance, of course, but you're also worried about parallelism. You have to expose a lot of parallelism, and the amount of parallelism you expose greatly affects what's going on. Here, um, I can explain this slightly, which is to say that, you know, the amount of uh, parallelism you can get on a GPU depends in part on how many registers the GPU kernel uses. And when you specialize the code, not only do you get generate sort of more succinct code that has fewer instructions for the compute that you're doing, but it also uses fewer registers. And that also has an effect on the performance because fewer registers can mean greater occupancy and so on. All right. So now we can ask the following question. Will using just in time compilation in C solve all of our compile time issues? <coughs> the answer is no. Sorry. But uh, it will solve compile time issues in a number of really important cases. And it has other benefits. So let me show you a couple of other examples. Uh, here is an excerpt from one of our scientific simulation codes that we have in the DOE. Uh, this excerpt actually comes from a proxy application, but it's very similar to the corresponding real application. And uh, you don't have to really understand all the details, but what you need to know is there's some point in the code in which it needs to run some calculation. I'll show you quickly what that calculation looks like on the next slide. And there's some bit of the runtime state of the program that is going to select which of these special template instantiations I want to use in order to evaluate some formula. And in, I've cut this off for the purpose of the slide, but uh, in the real application there are 32 more lines like that. Uh, and this file takes a really long time to compile. And to make a long story short, we switch this implementation to use the client get implementation. Uh, compiling this file now takes a third the time, which made people smile. Uh, and I'll show you something else that's interesting. This, by the way, is what that calculation looks like schematically. All right. So here's what happened when we evaluated the performance of the application using the client git implementation as opposed to the existing implementation that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, here, it was benchmarked for different choices of a parameter that we, that's called the polynomial order. I'm not going to explain this in detail. But needless to say, you can see here, each color is a different polynomial order. And for each color, there are essentially two 
lines and the area in between the lines is shaded. Um, one thing to realize is as this, uh, as you proceed here on the x-axis, points per compute node goes up, the two lines essentially converge. That's good. It means that the just-in-time compiled version performs as well as the ahead-of-time specialized version, except that the code now compiles three times faster. But there's another interesting thing here, which is sort of a side point, but it also speaks to the advantages of using good infrastructure. So there's a shaded difference here as the points per compute node goes down. And the shaded difference is because the ClangJIT version is actually slightly faster than the implementation they had before. And why is that? Well, essentially it's because this code right here is essentially doing the same thing that ClangJIT's instantiation hash table lookup is doing. Except that ClangJIT, ClangJIT's instantiation, instantiation hash table um, is a much higher performance hash table than that one. Okay. There are other overheads too, but so that's nothing fundamental, but it's a nice side effect. All right. Uh, let me say something about costs. I mentioned amortized overheads. So if you take a Intel Xeon, actually I have which one on the next slide, some other slide, uh, and we just look at what are the overheads for this. So here we have, uh, as I said, if the instantiation already exists as a cache looker, how long does that take? And the answer is it takes about 140 nanoseconds. This is on a 2.2 gigahertz processor, something like that. Uh, if the instantiation already exists, but you still miss in the cache, you might as well, why would that happen? Well, okay, not for a good reason. But if you remember back at the beginning of the presentation, I showed you that example where you could name types with a string. Well, there are different ways of naming the same type for the string. So you might get into the instantiation process and then discover you already have the thing. Okay, that's possible. How long does that take? Well, the answer is it takes about 65 microseconds. Uh, and then if you actually have to compile a new template, how long does that take? Well, it takes at least a few milliseconds. Of course, it might take a lot longer than that, as we saw earlier. Uh, but the simplest kind of template, if it's essentially empty, you take a few milliseconds. That's just how long it takes to get through Clang and LVM and the whole rest of the pipeline. Okay. Let me show you a second example. This is not an HPC example. Uh, but it's an example I really like. So, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, have seen Hannah's talk on the compile time regular expression library, but this is kind of neat. She had a talk earlier this week, and there was a talk last year. So if you haven't seen these, I recommend going to YouTube and checking them out. But this is a library that allows you to compile regular expressions at compile time. And it's very efficient. So this seemed like a natural thing to try. I thought like, oh, well, now I have a disk for template. I should try to do this at runtime. See how that works. Okay. But I, I think it's, it's useful to think about this. Okay, so here quickly uh, is essentially what this benchmark looked like. This is the version that uses uh, the Boost regular expression library. You compile the regular expression, you run it over some string, and it times it and outputs the answer. Okay. And it runs it some number of times. That's sort of nice. There's an equivalent version for Boost Expressive. Uh, I use PCRE. You know what PCRE is, it's the Pro Compatible Regular Expression Library. It's a very popular open source library for evaluating regular expressions. Uh, it does the same thing. Now, here's the interesting part. How do you hook up CTRE to this system? Well, you do something like this. So here I have a template, it has the special attribute on it. And I have a string representing the regular expression. And I'm going to provide that as a parameter, a non-time template parameter to this template. It has to come in as an array because I have to know the size because it has to turn into a context for initialized variable, context for initialized array to be processed. And uh, 
And the CTRE library expects to get this in the form of its fixed string uh, type. And the way you do that is you have a, a class template which has a static context for a member, and you use the string to initialize this thing. This is kind of the trick that makes you able to put all the pieces together. And otherwise, it works the same way. There's a loop around the matter. OK. So OK, let's look at what happens when I try this. So this is the runtime performance of the matching. Uh, I took a string of 2 to the 12th A characters. I ran that matching loop 100,000 times. And I timed that. And the regular expression, by the way, is A star B plus. So in other words, you know, 0 or more A characters followed by 1 or more B characters. So because the buffer is filled with A's, uh, this pattern actually doesn't match. But you can't figure that out until you get to the end of the buffer. OK. So here's what happens. We have boost regular expression library, takes about four seconds. Express it takes about one second. PSCRE actually has some unfortunate behavior here. It takes quite a long time. The JIT is much faster, though. Uh, but the interesting thing is that when the JIT version of the compile time regular expression library uh, is actually even faster. So it's about 50% faster than PCRE's JIT. That made me smile. OK, but let's be fair. So let's talk about the compile time. So, so compiling uh, the compile time regular expression with the JIT took about three and a third seconds. And all the other methods to compile their regular expressions took less than 0. 0.0004 seconds. OK. so. That means that the CTRE matcher was twice as fast as PCRE's JIT on that particular machine. Uh, you know, but it took 10,000 times longer to compile. So that doesn't seem so great. And it's interesting because it kind of speaks to the trade off here. But, you know, I have a frowning face on the slide. That still seems sort of unfortunate. But as I said, the purpose of this talk is not really to talk about this particular tool, it's really to think about the future. So let me think about the future. So one thing that's interesting is the CTRE library right now uses a lot of template metaprogramming in order to do its processing. And it tells me that she's working on a contextfer version, a version that uses a lot more contextfer function evaluation in order to do that logic. That could increase the speed of the compilation by up to a factor of 100. Now, let's think about the speed at which expert evalu expert evaluation actually happens inside the compiler. Clang's context for evaluation is not particularly fast, but people are working on that. In fact, there was a feature that was committed to Clang just a few days ago uh, to introduce a bytecode style interpreter for context for expressions into, into Clang. This is going to be used to optimize that evaluation. And frankly, I expect at some point we're going to end up jitting the context for bytecode inside of Clang to increase the speed of the compilation. And so I came to this conclusion, by the way, when I was sitting in one of the recent standards committee meetings, and we were talking about the stood embed proposal. And there was a discussion about the speed of context for evaluation and whether it would be a good idea in order to allow people to read in file data at context for time and process it because context for is fairly slow as an evaluation engine. And someone said, oh, but people aren't going to read in very large files. <laughs> uh, but my point is the following, which is that uh, you know, if, if, we have a, if we have headroom that's a factor of 100, and this is this is fairly realistic in terms of context for evaluation speed. And the speed of the compilation of the regular expressions could increase by about that same factor. Well, that's also a factor of 10,000. So now we're, we're back in competitive space. Now, I don't know if that's actually going to happen. But my point is that in the future, this may not be quite as crazy as it looks right now. And I think other factors are going to push us there, like regardless of 
what we do for just in time compilation. Okay. Uh, let me quickly mention some of the challenges in design optimization. So uh, there are a number of reasons why this special attribute that we have on function templates in, in, in this implementation may not be the best language design choice. For one thing, the templates themselves aren't special. It's the point of instantiation that's special. And you really want the marker there. The second issue is, because the point of instantiation is the special part, you want that to be the thing that stands out during code review. And right now, it looks kind of normal. And that's, that's bad. The, right now, uh, there's no good way of getting out errors or managing resources. Uh, obviously, if you're compiling C++ code, sometimes it may not compile. Uh, I mean, maybe your interpreter ran out of resources or what have you, but also maybe you put in some invalid value and you hit a static assert. Now I could say, like, well, that's UB, but that's not really helpful. So you have to have some way of managing resources and getting out errors. Uh, maybe the compilation process is asynchronous and you want to expose that somehow. That's something else. In the proposal that I uh, first wrote for the standards committee, we highlighted a couple of other options here. Uh, some markers we could put near the template instantiation, maybe something that looks like a library interface. Uh, there are other concerns as well. Uh, so one thing about template instantiation in C++ right now is it's not stateless. So instantiating templates can trigger friend injection. That can actually affect later overload resolution. That's a challenge that would have to be addressed in defining the semantics for this thing if you want to be able to later reclaim templates that aren't being used, instantiations that aren't being used. Uh, the second question that comes up around ABI. So if I have an application that wants this runtime template instantiation and I embed all this data into my executable, that, does that data become part of the ABI? Like, is that something that the system has to continually support in order to run the application? Or maybe that's just another error mode and a, another way that, this, that the compilation can fail. But again, we come back to this issue that the compilation might fail and you may have to have some mechanism for dealing with that. Uh, the questions have come up around uh, you know, how this interacts with code signing technologies, how this interacts with, you know, how this works on systems that don't allow just-in-time compilation or arbitrary just-in-time compilation, how this, uh, you know, whether we can have a fallback interpreter. Uh, some way of dealing with, with these cases of, of failure. Uh, and finally, the serialized ASTs can be large. C++ compilation can be a lot of memory. All of these things are important. Uh, so at the last standards committee meeting, we talked about this a lot. Here I've highlighted some of the, the feedback I received. Uh, one, which you probably do not now find surprising, was we should investigate having the marker for the JIT closer to the point of the template instantiation, at the temp point of template instantiation. Uh, we should figure out some way of dealing with types that doesn't involve string. <coughs> I suppose no one's surprised by that. Um, I was asked to investigate interactions with modules. I said, in, in the current implementation that I have, the system actually uses the modules infrastructure. But whether that implies that there's a language level interaction with modules, I think is less clear, but this is something that we should think about. And the final thing was that the outcome of performing one of these instantiations should return some kind of object, a callable object of some kind. This could help deal with errors. But the other important thing is that it will allow you to have some mechanism for managing lifetime and managing resources. The, uh, in the current system, once you instantiate one of these things, you kind of can't ever get rid of it. Because you would have no way of knowing at any given point in the future whether that template was not in the call stack of some other thread. So you could never really remove them. And that's probably problematic for a lot of use cases. All right. So I mentioned at the beginning auto-tuning. For a lot of the use cases that we've been thinking about for this, we're going to want to build something like that on top. This system allows us to construct these kinds of systems where we can compile code, where we can run it and measure its performance, where we can 
adapt to the problem and to the environment in which the program is executing. Uh, and then to do that dynamically as the application runs in pre-tuning phases or both. And that's what we see for the future of this. But from a C++ perspective, there's an underlying question. There is a fundamental reality here, which is that often at runtime, you know more about the environment of your application at runtime than you did when you compiled it. And can the language provide some facility to help us deal with that? What, what is the underlying set of capabilities that the language could or should provide in order to deal with this? And from the C++ perspective, that's the interesting question that we're aiming to answer. So to conclude, there are a number of factors that are pushing us to look at this direction to consider adding just-in-time compilation support into C++ to figure out what that would mean. First, there are hardware trends and performance requirements, the need for specialization, the need to deal with heterogeneous systems and to do so adaptively. To take it, and, and if you combine that with the fact that modern just-in-time compilation technology has improved to the point where this is practical, to look at the evolution of C++ and see that context for programming, reflection, other capabilities that are coming in the future are going to make this kind of setup increasingly powerful. And lastly, the need for programming productivity, the need to be able to specialize code to get high performance with, you know, in a way that programmers can actually use. You, you can't pre-compile all possible permutations and expect that your developers are going to sit there and wait for that. So all these things lead us to try and think about what would it mean to have just-in-time compilation support in C++ and what might that look like. So thank you very much. Um, can you talk about the possibility of uh, parallelizing these jitting? So could I do that in threads? Could I do that in like an MPI situation? Uh, sure. So uh, <laughs> those are actually two different things, actually. We're, we're thinking of both of these things. So um, in some sense, I feel like this is uh, you know, independent of, of threading. In the current implementation, uh, there are appropriate locks in various places, so different threads can invoke the just-in-time compilation engine, and, and that's fine. Uh, there, you may think about if you had many things to compile, would you want to trigger them in threads that haven't been parallel? You might, right? That's the sort of application design consideration, at least in the present system. Uh, for MPI and distributed computation, this is also an interesting question because uh, if you have a lot of uh, machines and they're trying to tune something or explore some configuration space, you might not want them all to do all of that repetitively, uh, redundantly. And so uh, we actually are working at Argon on systems that will let us uh, distribute that work and coordinate it with a smaller set of central coordinators and then have them drive the exploration, the auto-tuning, just the compilation, that kind of thing. Hey, David Holman, Sandia National Labs. What is um, what's the reasoning behind why you started from strings for types and not for types for types? If we had types for types, we would have just dropped this right into a lot of our things, but. Well, we don't really have a good system otherwise for being able to dynamically compose uh, templates. So uh, this was sort of a pragmatic solution I think we're, we're definitely going to look for something else. I mean, it, you, can't, you can't take a type ID of an uninstantiated template and then kind of put it together with other type IDs at runtime in the current system, right? So you need something like that. And that's, that's kind of one of the things that uh, we're going to look at is some other system besides strings. The strings with just a pragmatic solution so that we could get the thing working and see how it, how it performed. And the second question is, in, in, in some arenas, uh, probably not HPC, but in some arenas, a competitor to this approach is uh, interpreting C++ uh, like Kling does. Um, have you looked at any kind of 
like benchmarking against like how many times you have to be running the kernel, the jitted kernel before you're faster than Kling? So I, I, I have looked at Kling. It's, it's difficult at times to get it to optimize well. Uh, one thing about Kling though is uh, Kling as an interpreter, A, performs a lot of file access. So it's hard to get it to work uh, in many environments in that sense. Uh, and the other thing is that it, uh, I mean, so Kling also just in time compiles, right? But uh, the, uh, you know, you could definitely think about these kinds of trade-offs. I think part of the problem is though, with the template instantiation, a lot of the cost is actually in the instantiation process. And Kling pays that in the, exactly the same way that Kling did, just does. Uh, I came to this talk expecting an entirely different kind of JIT, but I really appreciate the talk. It was a great talk, so thank you for that. Thanks. The JIT I was talk uh, thinking about was basically a whole program low type optimization, like link time optimization, except postponed even further. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that and how, how much this would help in that direction? So uh, I, I view these as more or less orthogonal technologies. We, we actually, at the lab, are working on that kind of JIT also for C++. Uh, for, for auto tuning, and there's a lot that you can do transparently, uh, you know, behind the scenes, just with the code that gets compiled in terms of iteratively, iteratively optimizing it and, and the like. Um, the the only issue is, I mean, a that doesn't actually need any language extensions, but b uh, that only gets to tune the code that was compiled. So you only get to choose the templates and such that you've actually instantiated. So it doesn't it doesn't address the use cases where you want to control that specialization and do different things. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have two questions. Uh, how does this work if the return type of the template uh, uh, differs, you know, for different uh, input types? Like what, what happens if my template returns, you know, the, the parameter that I've passed in? Yeah, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> so, well, I mean, right. Because I mean, what's going to happen is that the, the compiler will, you know, complain that it yeah. can't deduce the type because it's not available. Um, second question: um, How does the how do you imagine this will interact with reflection? In particular, um, like a lot of our discussions in Plus reflection today have been about static reflection and static generative reflection. This seems like it borders on the space of dynamic uh, generative reflection, kind of. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's actually an interesting. I mean, and. You know, on one hand, you can say, well, there's not really an interaction except for the fact that they're both features that you can use in the C++ language. Uh, but there actually is an interesting interaction. So the interesting interaction is that you really want to minimize the amount of data you store into the object files in order to uh, compile things at one time. So um, the question is, how do you limit that? So in the current implementation, we don't limit it, and the object files are big. Uh, but in the future, you may want them not to be so big. So you want to limit those things. So how do you limit it? Well, you could look at the templates and say, okay, which things could I possibly reference? And I'm only going to save those. And one of the interesting things with reflection is it really increases the amount of stuff that you can get to, right? Because you can now look at all the types, look at all their types, and, and, and you can't use the, the identifiers that are named in the templates in any way to filter out stuff that might not be useful at, at runtime. And so there's an interesting interaction there, and I, we haven't really figured out exactly what we want to do about that. It's an interesting question. Hi, Hal. Um, this is Mark Coleman from Sandy National Labs. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, do authors of jitted code that intends to be jitted have any influence over the performance of jitting other than the usual ways to reduce compile time? Like, does code intended to be jitted have a different preferential style? Uh, not, not currently, no. So I have a comment and a question. Sure. So this looks like a very exciting. It looks like this can be the enabler for Alex Andrescu's design by indiscretion because there's a bunch of characteristics you just wouldn't know at a, you know, at compile time. Uh, my question is, would it be possible to use um, a jitted um, template object uh, as a class member? No. So right, right now, it, I, I only deal with function templates. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. So one is it's, it's natural. The second uh, issue is that I don't have to deal with what does partial specialization mean. Uh, but, but, but one thing I'll mention is 
within the function template that you jit, you can instantiate other templates. And you can do in there whatever you want. But I don't have any ability to have a kind of, because what, the question is like, what happens if it, like, what happens if the size changes depending on the parameters, right? So you have to, I'm not, I'm not dealing with any of the complications in that space. Uh, but within the function template, you can instantiate whatever the templates you want. That's like what the CTRE example does, for example. It's a great hawk, thank you, Hao. Um, what about the debuggability? So, uh, at the, uh, interesting question. Um, so luckily, in this implementation, uh, it uses LLVM, and LLVM has a, uh, like already has support for the necessary hooks for debuggers like GDB to uh, become, uh, to be notified when dynamically compiled code is added to a, a running program and to go and look at the sections and find the dwarf metadata and whatever. So uh, I haven't played with this extensively. In principle, it kind of just works, but we'll see. All right, well, thank you very much.